Welcome everyone, and we are delighted uh, to have tonight Ed O'Connor, who has uh, um, been off on duty uh, in Afghanistan, right, Ed? No, Kuwait, but the Middle East. Kuwait, okay. <laughs> and so, um, what, you just came back at the beginning of the year, I think, right? Uh, end of January, beginning of February, I uh, took my terminal leave that brought me into March, uh, burning up my the vacation days I wasn't able to use, and uh, I came back to work March 8th. Kind of had to hit the ground running, it sounds like. Pretty much, yeah. It's, well, that's the nature of anything, right? I don't think there's anything other than, uh, you know, being a child, you get to kind of ease into it. everything's just so, once you graduate high school, it's thrown at you. There's no... <laughs> well, we're, we're delighted to have you here, Ed. Uh, as you know, or may not know, um, we've, uh, we've had the honor of having Chief Mason talk to us and um, the Superintendent of Schools, Annie, um, drawing a blank mm -hmm. here. <laughs> McKenzie. Annie McKenzie. <laughs> um, and now you. So um, I'm really sorry about all the kind of uh, having to uh, figure out our timetables here, but glad you were finally able to, to make it. Um, as you know, um, we had sent you uh, our mission statement. And essentially what, what we've asked of, the, of our other guests is that, you know, you tell us what it is you know, that, you know, is, is, is a priority for you um, in, in regards to sort of uh, how you implement diversity, equity, and inclusion within your uh, branch, and, and, and maybe ways in which we can be helpful as a committee to augment the sort of stuff that you're doing. Um, and you know, I'm happy to turn the floor over to you. And, if, and, and you know, we can we can start with a uh, you know with a question, or if you have something you would like to just sort of tell us about um, about the things that you're finding out uh, as as the HR director. Yeah, sure. So, uh, do I have the ability to share my screen? It looks like I do. So, I think first I kind of have a living document here. And this is sort of kind of what I envision HR, you know, to be in Hadley. Um, if you were to look at any organization, uh, no two HR functions are really the same. There are some items that uh, managers kind of manage themselves. There's some that are, are placed in the HR department. Um, but I figure we could start by looking at the framework of, of where I see my department, because it's the newest department in town. And then, then we can kind of dig into um, you know, some of the, some of the finer items. Uh, these aren't necessarily listed in order. Uh, these were kind of listed as I had conversations with folks and where I thought maybe they fell into some of the different HR disciplines. So um, let's see if I can get my screen sharing here. Someone might have to click the approve button. So uh, I'm not sure who the moderator is for this, but it says host participant screen sharing disabled. Okay. And then I'm just going to close a few extra windows to make sure I don't have anybody's, um, you know, personal information up or anything like that. And I don't, so we should be okay. Let's try this maybe one more time. So I've made you the co-host. You may have to accept that. Okay. So we're going to go with screen two and I'm going to share it. So within, you know, there's, there's multiple HR disciplines, right? You know, we have recruiting, um, compensation, performance management. So this is kind of what I see for the town of Hadley, as you can see I've highlighted here. So uh, the umbrella is recruiting a great team, developing people, compensating fairly, integration of effort, maintenance, and then advise and counsel. And so, you know, of course there's uh, an area, every, every single one of these areas has some type of, you know, what we would call, you know, diversity factor. And I think when we look at recruiting a great team, I think it's important to note everybody's a diversity hire, right? Everybody fits something that you want in your organization. Now, sometimes there's misalignments and there's, you know, you want to correct those alignments, but 
you know, when you, when you look at what you're trying to fill in terms of diversity, I think a lot of people tend to default to race, but then there's other items that are always uh, on the table as well. So race, gender, um, you know, or gender identity, you know, there's some, some new terms coming out around, around that area, but then there's also uh, veteran status. And then I kind of also default to, to, to socioeconomic status, educational background and, and work history. You know, I'm a, I'm a poor kid from Worcester and poor is putting it lightly. Let me tell you, um, you know, the way I grew up as a child, um, you know, when you think of what's available in this country in terms of disparity and access to healthcare, um, you know, I look at the conditions of how I grew up, it's still hard to believe that, um, you know, that existed then, let alone now. So, um, you know, that's kind of where I tend to look at, uh, you know, diversity from that's the lens that I have, you know, the veteran, socioeconomic and then education status, you know. Um, so, and everybody has a lens to offer. You know, obviously if you're, you know, if you're immigrated from, a, from another country, you have a different lens to offer. I'm just not, simply not going to have that. Um, and that's just kind of, the, right, that's the nature, that's the beauty of it is, um, you know, we all have a different background. So uh, developing people, you know, of course that comes to, you know, policies, how we manage good management practices, um, you know, having good program in place, compensating fairly. Uh, we, we did have a, I'm, I'm sure if you've been paying attention to town government, you've heard this compensation study that's come up a, a number of times. Um, implementing it, I don't think is advantageous. I, I don't think the methodology was fully transparent. Um, and then I don't think it was as objective as it should have been. I think there's some subjective pieces in that in that plan that, that didn't benefit the message um, being sent in that study. And then integration and effort. So the easy things there were the first, were the first things that came to mind, ADA and FMLA. Uh, but then, you know, beyond that, a respectful workplace requirement. You know, it's one thing to sit there and say, we're going to follow the law. But it's another thing when, when you want to move beyond the law and, and make a place um, somewhere people want to be. You know, and then there's something to be said for that. Maintenance, you know, everything's got a maintenance cycle. Whether your car needs an oil change or, or your organization, uh, you know, you need some follow-up, uh, you know, to hear those unhidden voices. So things like cyclic training, succession planning, audits, um, and then, of course, advise and counsel. You know, part of HR is making sure you have the, the right structure to what it is you want to achieve, you know, as a as a fast growing town um, and organization, you know, we're still following a model of government that uh, has been largely unchanged, you know, probably since the 1600s. And there was a, a, a big change a few years back with uh, making the treasurer and collector appointed positions because they become so specialized. You wanna make sure you have someone with the appropriate credentials. So, you know, in a lot of ways, it was, it was more equitable to move that to an appointed position versus elected, because you wanna make sure you have the the best and most qualified person available. Um, and so, you know, with a lot of that said, where does that move me in terms of what I'm trying to do with HR and, and, and where we're moving? So I'm gonna switch and just kind of share uh, what Massachusetts says or the protected categories. So some folks uh, can listen. Again, this is just the legality of it. I hope to move this organization and a lot of the organization already is there to a place where it's not something we do because the law wants us to do it. We do it because it's the right thing to do. Um, and and that's, that's where we wanna be in, in terms of culture, regardless of your department. Um, and also, you know, as a town, both the voters as a legislative body and the employees uh, moving that, those, those policies forward. So, um, <clears throat> You know, I kind of said everybody's a diversity hire. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now that everybody had the chance to look there. Um, I was looking at one of your questions and kind of, uh, you know, evolved around resources. And now that budget season's over, it might be too little too late. But with Corona, I don't think bringing up this point would have changed much. But I would like to have a, a bigger budget that focuses on, um, you know, some, some of these themes. Um, you know, kind of like I said, just conversing with Kayla a little bit, no one's an expert in any one thing. You know, I'm very much a generalist. Um, diversity and inclusion is, is its very own separate and very specific discipline in the realm. 
of HR. And so, you know, there are people that have dedicated entire careers to this. So, you know, in a perfect world, I would love to have somebody with that background to uh, either back up where I think we are or say, hey, no, you you need some improvement. You know, it's always, it's always good to have a second reading. Um, and then also outside trainers, you know, it's, I, I can do um, training and, and it's fine, you know, it, it meets the block, but I don't think it has as big of an impact when, when it's the person you work with every day. I feel like something kind of gets missed, you know. Um, when you have specialized outside trainers, you know, they kind of, they break down the barrier. Um, you know, they, they're a completely neutral party. And so sometimes I think they, they get a, an attention uh, that you wouldn't get from someone you work with every day. And so, um, you know, where the committee could, could possibly help with that is, is maybe identify one or two of those opportunities for, for good outside trainers, you know, that reach, reach a wide audience. Um, and then also, you know, perhaps sources of funding or, or grants, if you know anybody in, in, in that area or neck of the woods that, that would like to assist, that would be uh, greatly appreciated. Uh, I'm waiting for this next cycle to kind of end, and then I'm going to put in for a, a workplace best practice grant and try to work with the Collins Center um, on some, you know, respectful workplace training and making sure our policies are, are where they should be. Um, but you know, that's a, you know, you can't just do it once and then say you're covered for 10 years, you know, everything's cyclical and you got to keep a pulse on it. So, um, so moving in further into some of those disciplines, hiring, you know, it's not just about advertising on your website or throwing a job ad in the paper. Um, you know, the, the best way to reach a wide audience to make sure, um, cause you, well, I guess I should back up. You can't recruit diversely if you're not advertising diversely. So everything starts at that job ad. So I, based on the amount of budget I have, I advertise every which way I can. Um, I use the town website and indeed is my primary, um, you know, sources. And then I will follow up with Facebook and use other echo chambers like the Amherst Air Chamber of Commerce. When I post something on Facebook, they'll take it off the, uh, my HR Facebook page and they'll advertise it on there. And then I also look to the community colleges, um, not so much the four-year universities because very it, there's no bang for the buck there. I don't get a lot of four-year college grads applying for my jobs that are fresh out. You know, our last few hires have really been for department heads and we kind of need someone for experience. So, um, but I look to the community colleges because there's a lot of folks who teach part-time there that are well-tenured and, and you know, might be looking for a career change or a lot of adult learners who, who maybe they don't have the education, but they have the years of experience. Um, and then I also, lastly, I reach out to the Mass Hire Career Centers. Um, if you're not familiar with Mass Hire, they have different names across the state. They had the, and they're partnered typically between a state and a major municipality. And a lot of uh, funding comes through the Department of Labor, but they've centralized their brand and they're now called Mass Hire. So if you wanna apply for unemployment or, or update your workforce credentials, or, or maybe even find a new job because you're underemployed, Mass Hire would be the, uh, the organization through the Department of Labor that will help you do that. <clears throat> um, now, in terms of everyday housekeeping uh, for diversity and equity, right now we're in the midst of overhauling our personnel policy. Um, it's had a, a revision in December, which mostly applied to comp time, I think there was one or two other small items. I wasn't here. You have to forgive me. Uh, I was deployed. But largely, it's been untouched for several years. And in there, um, you would, if you're you know, familiar with employment and labor law, you'll see some inequity right off the bat. It doesn't touch on some updates to parental leave policies, and it doesn't touch on um, some items around pregnant workers' fairness and moms who wish to, to nurse or have private space, um, you know, to express breast milk and a few other things. So we're, we're working through that to make sure that that's in there. Um, and then also, uh, you know, the, the, right, everything has a second, third order effect. So it's not there necessarily on a policy basis, but if I have an employee who decides to, to have a child or an adopt, you know, how, how do we make that happen procedurally? And um, so we have to identify some space that that someone may be able to use if they're if they're nursing in um, you know 
maybe identify some ways because you know we don't have a lot of depth chart around here if someone needs to take parental leave how can we offset some of their responsibilities to keep those major pieces functioning when moving forward um <clears throat> i did kind of touch on the compensation study so now we're going to be moving into our own we're going to do our own compensation study here for the town and um I had talked about subjective metrics. It's not quite clear where the consultant decided what, what those peer towns would look like. And so what I did is I, I'm gonna pull up the list so I don't misquote myself here. <clears throat> um, I took five community metrics and I ran them across the whole Commonwealth. So all 360 some odd towns. And what I came up with, um, it's kind of interesting, really. So the metrics were uh, income per capita, uh, an obscure metrics called the municipal growth revenue factor. But where that's important is where it notes uh, funding around changes, like say around libraries or schools. It's not major stuff you would see in your budget. It comes from maybe some alternative funding sources, but it tells you, you know, where, where some of those contributions are coming from. That. If you're the average citizen, you might not have a, a, a full pulse on. <clears throat> um, and then of course, population, you have to consider population. Tax levy, so the total tax levy, um, not necessarily just your percentage that you're using within your levy. And then revenue by source. So revenue by source, I mean, um, aid and local receipt from uh, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, uh, local taxes, either from businesses, residential, um, and then, of course, you know, grants and, and special acts of legislation, a few other things. Uh, I, and then I also took into account Amherst and Northampton because we share the same labor market. Some folks have a taste for that, others don't, but you, I, I don't think you can dismiss your two largest neighbors by any means because you share the you know, it's that you, sh you share the river for crying out loud. Why wouldn't you, sh you know, take, take the people into account? So, um, so what that brought me uh, for, for comparable towns is Amherst, Deerfield, Granby, Hamden, Northampton, South Hadley, Southampton, and Williamsburg. Oh, and my other discriminating factor was about a half hour's drive. Um, and so we're going to use those communities um, to kind of evaluate where we are. And um, and it's right. That's something you can explain. That's that's a, an objective metric. Um, so and, and that kind of moves toward where I where I move for for hiring. Um, you know, before before there was an HR director. You know, it kind of goes back to that second layer. You know, when I interviewed, I had a panel of five people. I had some some questions you could grade fairly objectively. And so now I'm gonna my goal, and I've been doing it, but you know, on a bigger level now that I'm not deployed insulating those hiring managers and making sure, you know, they're doing a good evaluation on, on the, um, their job, both the job description and then on what they're, they're measuring those potential candidates against in terms of their qualifications. Um, sort of a kind of a flip. I, oh, and I'm sorry, I made a note here and I don't know why I skipped over it. Uh, in the policies, looking at fairly, new, you know, um, neutral language. I don't think you can fully take, you know, the English language is made up of 10 of the language. You can't fully remove a masculine or feminine word for, for everything, but, um, you know, we certainly do our best to make sure people, people know they're included when they're looking at a job description. Just out of curiosity, I came across a gender decoder for job descriptions, and um, I ran the two most recent job descriptions through that. And just out of curiosity, just a show of hands, just for fun, um, if you think my job descriptions, and this is two job descriptions, one for Park and Rec and one for Board of Health, if you think my job descriptions are more masculine, raise your hand. And I guess they're not mine, the managers wrote them, you know. Nobody wants to, that's okay. If you think they're more feminine, raise your hand. I'm, I'm sorry, you're muted, Margaret. What are those job descriptions? What? What are we? We don't. There's nothing on the what screen. Are we looking at. Oh, I didn't put them up. I'm are you sorry. putting something on the screen? Because no, I'm lost. I'm not. No, I'm just talking. Yeah. So, <laughs> I guess it would help if you if you had to read them. But it, it was really just a last minute exercise. 
So I ran them both through this gender decoder, supposedly as an algorithm. Um, those two job descriptions are actually listed as strongly feminine coded. And this is where it gets tricky. So the masculine coded words for the admin assistant for the Board of Health were independently determining an individual. Right, most people are like, I'm not sure where they came up with that. It makes no sense. On the other end, you know, so I don't necessarily agree. And I don't know about you guys. I'm just talking from, from my perspective. I don't know that I agree those are masculine words, maybe in some ways, sure. But I also don't agree necessarily that the feminine coded words are feminine. So this is really an interesting perspective. Um, support. Would you, those, would you say those those titles again? Uh, one is for the admin assistant to the Board of Health. And the other is the Park and Rec Director. Hmm. So uh, the other... So the feminine coded words, and there's more of them, is support, responsibility, responding, feel, quiet, committed, and agreement. So, you know, most of those I find to be, you know, business transactional words, you know, you support your manager, right? You, you're committed to your job, you know? I, so it's, you know, it, it's interesting because, um, you know, it just gives you a different way of looking at things that maybe you didn't have before. Is the premise that if you that certain words attract a male identified or female identified applicant is that the reason to put those through this decoder? Yeah, you want to be I'm more not, neutral. It's not mm -hmm. something I ever I ever did really. Um, I just happened to be looking at some uh, some training around diversity and, and an HR organization uh, pointed me to this um, and. You know, much like we have a diverse array of head nods, we're not. You know, maybe you're convinced, maybe you're not. But I think it, I think something like this could could bring out something you might not have thought was more masculine or more feminine. You know, I, I think you know if I were to look at the other job description. So if I were to look at Park and Rec, um, determines and principles were the more masculine words, and then the feminine coded words. Again, respond, responsible, responsibilities, which, I mean, everybody has responsibilities, right? So, um, but then other things that maybe you'd kind of make a little sense, but I don't think these were uh, written in a feminine coded lens, but children, the word children, um, but the fact of the matter is there's children in the park and rec program. So this, you know. <laughs> what what other word would you use? Maybe youth. Constituents. Maybe youth. I mean, that seems yeah, I don't. <laughs> silly. So it's um so it's interesting, you know. But uh, looking at that now that I know, you know, something like children might might have a different perception. Youth might be a more appropriate word. And if you really have to get down to uh, somewhere where where you're expressing a, a younger age, say five or six, um, you know. Uh, you know, younger youth might be a better, you know, more neutral way of, of getting people's attention versus swaying your job descriptions in one or another direction. So it's, it, it can be interesting. Um, uh, but, you know, I don't do that for everything. Like I said, that was just kind of an exercise in, in light of the, the meeting. Um, but with the, the policies also come our union agreements. And so we did one year extensions, but we're getting ready to, uh, we'll move very soon into the, the formal bar bargaining process. And my goal is to make sure, you know, we, we don't have any bias languages in those, those agreements. And then when I look at things like, you know, uniform allowances or um, some of the incentives maybe around laundry services, you know, make sure it's something that can accommodate everybody. Um, you know, because if, if I have say, I'm just making this up. Let's say I have eight men in, on the DBW labor crew and eight women. And the men always go through t-shirts, but for some reason, women tend to use more boots. But the provision in the uh, bargaining agreement calls for more t-shirts. Um, I want to make sure both can have boots and t-shirts at the end of the day. Um, so, you know, look at that. Make sure it's not too restrictive. Make sure, you know, they're objective. Um, and then also in that lens with unions and policies, looking at those job descriptions and making sure those physical requirements, you know, aren't something that someone just pulled out of the wind, but if you really need to lift 50 pounds, why, you know, um, 
you know, and there, there might be a need, there might not be a need. You know, if uh, you're the board of health admin clerk, why do you need to lift 50 pounds? You, you limit yourself to a very small pool of candidates. Um, and, you know, and not just, you know, on a gender basis, you know, when you think of, you know, disability and a, and a few other things, or, or perhaps even age, um, you, you really limit yourself and, and uh, intentionally or unintentionally harm somebody else. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, we're doing all of this work. Um, the, main, the main thing I think in accomplishing this is I'm not doing it by myself because I'm just one person and, you know, um, you know, I, I might be a good guy, but I could, you know, accidentally put the wrong uh, opinion on something and it has a bad second, third order effect. So, um, you know, I might think DPW needs 10 boots and five t-shirts, but I was wrong. So uh, doing this stuff as a group. So the personnel policy is happening as a group. I have, um, you know, I wish I had a few more participants, but, you know, everybody has a a schedule and an interest, but I, I, I have a, a, a quite a few folks from police and public safety. I've got one from DPW, and of course there's myself, library, and one other town hall employee. And I feel like I might be forgetting somebody, but uh, you know we have a good cross section, making sure that there's some good input on these personnel policies, so that way we have a nice um, you know world view, so to speak. Uh, one of the biggest things I think I've learned that I didn't, wouldn't have expected to jump into so quickly starting here was reasonable accommodations. The pandemic made, made it very aware, um, one, how quickly you need to provide the accommodation, but two, uh, you know, not to take somebody's, I guess, disposition on the surface, you know, so if we never had COVID-19, that, per that person would never have had a, a care in the world. But then other people come forward and say, hey, I have some, some serious concerns. What can I do to help mitigate this? And can you help me do it? Um, and, and so I, I was really grateful for that opportunity because that's hard, right? That's a self-disclosure. Um, but then it also you know, opened up some, some areas of opportunity that I think um, you know, as an employer, you know, one, we should have in the back of our, our mind, and two, maybe once uh, we have some financial cushion, um, maybe some type of revolving account to, to prepare for something like that. So if someone needs a special piece of equipment or accommodation, it's a little more, it's a little easier to, to reach for that than, than maybe to have to be reactionary. Um, and then I also had a couple of odd notes. I noticed you had some questions around what our workforce looks like and how many live in Hadley. So I, I didn't have the numbers for you by police, uh, but uh, I think it's about 60% of your employees live in Hadley. And then uh, the rest are, are pretty close in the, the outlying communities. Uh, you know, I'm not too far away, I'm a half hour away in Chicopee. You have some folks in, in, in Pelham and Hatfield and Waitley and Sunderland. So most folks aren't traveling uh, too far. There's one person I think that uh, lives over an hour away, but they're the exception versus the rule. So, um, so that's kind of what I'm trying to tackle. And probably sounds like a lot. There might have been, you know, one or two things that that I've missed. But you know, at the end of the day, I you know I I want this town to be you know a place somebody wants to work, somebody wants to live. You know, and if I think if we're doing the right things and, and, and we educate people the right way, you know, some of the, some of these topics around uh, diversity, equity, inclusion will uh, kind of sort of be done almost naturally versus uh, versus a hindsight. And so, we'll, as we modernize our government, that's the direction I'd like to see us go. Does anybody have any questions for me? Yes, sir. Um, I have linked three linked questions. Uh, they're pretty basic. What is your uh, stated role in government? What is your staff? How is your staff? And uh, what is your budget? Sure. Uh, so my budget, a large part of my budget, I don't have much control over because it's dedicated to employee benefits and their fixed costs. Um, outside of that, the next largest piece is salary. 
And then I have a few thousand dollars that are split up between uh, training, membership, uh, professional memberships, and um, oh, I'm having a moment. You know, and I just went through this with the finance committee. <laughs> I, you have to forgive me. I have another budget I manage for the Army Reserve, which is also quite sizable. So let me get in here so I can give you some more specifics. All right, so my uh, pure HR budget is roughly $150,000. So of that 120 is salary, then we have payroll services, dues, um, training, and then office supplies is, is basically the remainder. I, I would like that training budget to be a little bit more. Um, you know, beyond diversity, equity, inclusion, there's some other items I would like to touch on um, you know, in terms of safety and, and management training, um, just to make sure people have the, the tools that, that they're equipped with to, one, both manage their workforce and two, um, you know, manage their day. You know, what's the, what's the best way to go about my dangerous job in TBW or police? So. How many are on your staff? Uh, it's Joan and I. There's two. So Joan manages most of the benefits and payroll. And then I manage both the department, but then also most of the labor issues, the advertising, working with the other boards and committees to make sure they're hiring their folks or if they have a labor issue, something to that effect. And what is your charge? Uh, uh, my charge, uh, it's kind of a lot, but more or less, you know, HR's function is, is one, to insulate the town in making employment decisions and advising on employment law. So when you think of things like, you know, maybe minimum wage, salary, um, making sure people are taking their lunches and breaks on time, that's part of it. But then there's the performance management piece, piece um, you know, making sure folks are trained adequately to do their job, making sure job descriptions are written accurately to perform their job. But if they're not performing, fairly bring them up to speed and coach them to performing. Uh, my, my least favorite part of my job is having to advise someone to terminate an employee. I absolutely hate that. Because uh, I, I feel like I failed more than anybody else when we have to do that. Um, and then of course, you know, look at the other component is maybe some job analysis, making sure the, the right amount of staff is, is, is tied to a function. And unfortunately, that, that's the one that tends to take uh, a wayside. Um, you know, we all tend to feel we're a little understaffed, so. So Ed, I, I, I guess I'm just a little surprised. Um, there are only two of you. <laughs> we get a lot done though. <laughs> we get a lot done between the two of us, yeah. But, but how many, I mean, I don't have any idea. How many employees are there in town? Uh, so we, we, I don't support schools through um, labor relations. I manage only the town side for labor relations and not just unions, any, any labor issue, uh, union, non-union, um, I'm involved there. Uh, so for payroll purposes, between volunteers, elected officials and appointed full-time or part-time employees, it's about 300, um, give or take. Uh, you know, and some volunteers are they're paid. So if you think of folks, and, and, and they're not consistently on the payroll. So if you think of like maybe some of the election workers, um, they only come on for the election. They get paid for, you know, their one or two or three days of work, depending on what they were helping out with the election in terms of preparation. And then of course, managing the election itself. Um, or, you know, some, some, some volunteers, they might not get paid regularly, but they might get reimbursed for an expense um, so like we, you know, or, or even if they're elected and unpaid, like maybe say a select board member, uh, we might reimburse them for, you know, mileage to uh, a professional training or, or meal expense. So, um, you know, somebody's always getting paid somewhere and then payroll will keep you busy. But, uh, and then on the town side for, for labor, um, you figure, you know, you have Board of Health has an employee Board of the Sessors has employees, Park and Rec has an, uh, an employee, and then the rest fall under the select board. So there's a good 125 or so folks under the administration, maybe a little more, maybe 150. If you want a good hard number, I'll get it to you. I wasn't prepared to offer that today. So 
No, it just, it just strikes me that, um, you know, your job encompasses not only the legal aspects of things, but, you know, you also, you're trying to hire the best person or you're trying to look at your policies and update them. And, um, and you know, I don't know how much your training budget is, but it doesn't sound like um, whatever it is, it's, it's much. Yeah, you know, uh, some, I mean, some of the departments naturally manage their own training, right? So police in service training, I'm not going to be involved in with too much. It's pretty much set as an institution and a legal standard. Uh, same thing with DPW. Um, you know, they have, they have some things they have to do by OSHA and it's insulated in their budget. But when there's, when there's pockets and there's need, new manager training, um, you know, if someone goes from being a crew member to being, um, you know, a crew leader or supervisor, or if someone's going from being a, uh, you know, a patrolman to a sergeant, there's those admin functions that you have, no matter what your, your, your field of expertise is. And so making sure, you know, those managers know where to go to, to one, either find the information if they can't find it, well, then they come to someone like me. So, um, so, so that's kind of where I would like my, my training budget to be centered around, um, you know, sure. Yes. The legal compliance, you know, um, you know, sexual harassment, diversity, you know, those sorts of um, those sorts of items, but then moving beyond that. And what do we do when someone becomes a new manager? You know, if someone wants to, to transfer departments, do I have the ability not to just train them in the new department, but do I, do I have the ability to, to hire and, and, and bring somebody on to replace them? So uh, that, that's kind of what I would want my, my training budget to be centered on. Um, you know, would be those, those broadening opportunities that, you know, and, and I'm sure we've all been there, right? A lot of those functions have been pushed by the wayside at, at some point or another, so. When, uh, when there is a hire to be done in the town, are you on the search committee for all those positions or do you advise those search committees? Um, it depends. With the town administrator I advised, um, you know, I helped draft the questions, make sure they were rated appropriately. Um, I, I didn't feel it was appropriate for, for me to vote because I wasn't sure I was going to be able to be there for the, the whole process. So um, with the Park and Rec Commission, uh, they, and it's fine, it's their prerogative. I don't think they want me voting, but I've been advising them in their, in their hiring process to make sure that, you know, they're doing it fairly and equitably. Um, the Board of Health has a position. It's, it's five to seven hours. Actually, I think it's just five hours. Um, I don't know that there's a, a, a need for me to vote just based on the level of the position. So, you know, it really depends if it's if it's a position that really, you know, you need to make sure those certifications, those qualifications, and everything. You know, because right, the, the higher you go, the, the tougher it is to find somebody. So, um, you know, Building, building inspector, collector, treasurer. I think that's something that would really be appropriate to, to have your HR person, you know, really well nested in. Um, but if you're hiring, say, you know, maybe a laborer or first, you know, first line police officer, I think that management staff has the wherewithal to, to really make sure they know what they're looking for. And so I would just guide them to make sure it's correct and, and then make them a, a, the right call. So you would be at least advisor on all these searches. Absolutely. Sometimes a vote. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Um, Ed, you, uh, earlier on, you said that uh, you work with the Collins Center. I, I'm not familiar with the Collins Center. Oh, I, not so much that I work with them, that I'm trying to get their services. So. Uh, UMass, there's also one here on Amherst, but it's not quite as robust in terms of the municipal um, functions that they can assist with. Uh, but there's two centers, the Collins Center in UMass Boston, and the name of the one in Amherst is escaping me, but uh, they, were, they were formed to benefit, you know, the Collins Center, mostly municipal government. Uh, but to benefit organizations for, you know, management practices, research projects, um, feasibility studies, there's a number of items that they can offer. And so they do have the ability to provide some good uh, management training, 
um, policy advisement, um, you know, just like anything, some people love it. Every, you know, you have your folks that rave about it and some go, oh, I would use something else. Uh, but I would like to, I, I spoke with their, uh, and, and the beauty of them is you don't have to bid for the services and they're, they're reasonable. I wouldn't say they're cheap, but they're reasonable. And the reason you don't have to bid is they were, they were developed specifically for this purpose um, to advise municipal government. So they're exempt from the bidding laws. So I, I think they'd be a, a pretty good fit for some of the HR stuff. I think they would really serve as well. You mentioned, um, you know, you're looking for grants and, uh, you know, um, as, as a source of potential funding. Um, is that something that, you know, something like the Collins Center can put you in touch with or? Yeah, so the person I spoke with at the Collins Center said she would actually help me write the grant. Um, that, that's part of their function as well as, as assisting with the grant. But, um, you know, I, in, in a perfect world, I would love to have a, a human resources information system it's a, it's a bulky cost, you know, I mean, it, it's, you're really looking at it as part of a capital investment. And so that's probably, you know, five, six, seven years down the road. Uh, but that's really where I would be looking for some of those, those lofty technology grants. So that way, you know, cause that, that can really help paint your picture. You know, there's a lot you can do there um, in terms of statistics and numbers, data modeling, you know, click click of a button, knowing what your workforce looks like, um, and also employee life cycle from 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 hire. I don't want to say hire to fire. Most people say it because it rhymes, but you know, from hire to regardless of how they go, whether they retire, or leave on their own accord. Um, you know, you can pull a number of different transitions and and really see some of those trends. You know, what you know promotions or or even if you were to shift it, look at peak vacation time usage, you know, there's, there's a lot of answers that can come out, come out of those systems that I think would be very beneficial. Um, you know, for, for me to look up, you know, the, the workforce and what it looks like now is, would, would be a, a very bulky process. It could be done, but it, it wouldn't be in an instant, so. You know, it sort of reminds me, uh, was at some point last year, um, we were just trying to get some data about the town, you know, population and, you know, break it down by age and then look at those who are working in the town and how many women, people of color, uh, that sort of thing. And you were on deployment at the time. And when I <coughs> called the acting HR person, um, I didn't realize that our town does not even, I guess, keep that data or not even keep the data. They don't, um, uh, they don't have a mechanism to capture that data. Yeah, and that's, uh, I, I kind of figured a little something out with our payroll software and you can, but again, it's, it's sort of an older system, it's bulky. So you can record things like, you know, gender and, uh, you know, race makeup or things like, you know, is English your firstborn language? You know, th there are those, those questions in the database. It's really extracting it. I think that's, that's the issue. So, and the other thing too, is there was no HR director here before. So I, I, I wouldn't be so inclined to say there's a lot of fidelity in the information that's in there. It would probably, you know, you'd have to start at the letter A and, and work your way down. Um, but I would like to, to get there. You know, I, right now, I think sort of the immediate needs are making sure positions are filled quickly and fairly. And then, of course, our policies, you know, our outdated policies are, are brought into a, to alignment. I think that's our, our first and in in immediate um, you know, direction to head because, uh, you know, that, that, that sets your tone immediately, right? Some of the first things people look up when they say, is this a place I want to work for? Well, they haven't touched their policy in eight years, maybe not, you know? So, um, but, you know, when I, when I look at who we have working for us, you know, there's some, you know, I feel like there's some things that should be brought to some folks' attention because they're, and in a positive way, you know, our, our town administrator is a, is a woman, um, you know, she has a substantial amount of years as a department head and municipal government and 
you know, our, our DPW director is from Africa. Our police department is very diverse. Um, fire department, um, I don't know where the, I've never asked this because it's, right, it's none of my business, but the, the gentleman on the fire department, you know, he was born outside the United States, if I recall correctly. So, um, you know, we have some, some very diverse folks, you know, our dispatchers, there's, there's quite a few ladies in the dispatch and the police force. Um, and then here in town hall, treasurer, um, collector, um, you know, they're, they're department heads and they're, they're all leading ladies. So uh, there is a, a good direction here. Now, I would say, you know, are most people Caucasian? Yes. You know, the town is like 95%, you know, Caucasian. So, you know, uh, but so if you're going to use your town as a metric, some will say that's skewed. Some say maybe you should go by county. Either way you do it, Hampshire County as a whole is largely Caucasian. So, um, you know, I, when I was in Worcester, it was easy to say, we want your workforce to look like your city. It's a very diverse city. When you say that here, it kind of sounds a little backwards, right? You know, and, and it's not, wait, it's not an ill-intended thing. I don't really know how to, how to describe it. But the one thing I want is if somebody with a, a background that's not, not a Polish immigrant farmer walks in and, and applies for a job that they feel comfortable and that they feel protected and, and knowing that they're in a place they want to work at. And that's, that's what I care about at the end of the day. So. And if I can speak out of welcome, and uh, I know very little about HR. So I, you know, my question may seem stupid, but I am just hearing the numbers, you know, like you say, 150 or 300, and there's two of you. Um, I just wonder if you have a sense yet, as you get your feet wet, um, if you have the resources to be proactive uh, or you feel at this point you just need to be reactive. And, and what I'm thinking of, I, I work at UMass and we have obviously resources. Um, and so we get training on uh, you know, anti-bullying in the workplace, or, uh, uh, you know, if you're going to be a supervisor of other people, there's some training, you know, instead of waiting for the complaints to come in and then having to react. Yeah, yeah so I, I feel like when I kind of first arrived with a little more reactive, now I feel it, it's more proactive. I mean, there's always going to be some type of reactionary issue. Um, when I did HR for the federal government, I was one person against probably about 250, give or take. So two against 300 is, sounds a little crazy. It's not an inappropriate number. Um, you know, uh, when I have an issue, I, I get issues both from employees and managers. Um, you know, I do have the time dedi to dedicate to, to um, helping people work through whatever it is they're they're working on. So, you know, if you were to look at a corporate business model, you would have, you know, one or two HR business partners to a division. So you might have one business partner to for 500 to 1,000 people. And the reason that they can kind of sort of do that is the payroll functions removed separately. Um, they have some better systems for, you know, punching in and punching out and whatnot. So... And when you yeah. mentioned your your you put up your slide and under recruiting a great team, you you have a bullet on developing intern program. Could you speak a little bit more about that, please? Yeah, I thought you know um, we don't really have interns now, but I, I do think there could be some good opportunities for interns within the town. Mm -hmm. uh, some of my immediate thought goes toward items like, information technology, um, and then maybe even something around, you know, housing planning and community development, uh, or even on the HR side, I was hoping to find a grad student who wanted to do the wage study for credit. Sure. Um, and so I, you know, I had just haven't had a chance to really develop that university partnership to move forward with that. Uh, when the idea of doing our own wage study was proposed. It was mid-semester when I called UMass. The only uh, the only 
folks I were getting, they wanted to do it for, you know, stipends. They wanted it as an extra big project, which I can't really blame them for that. It just wasn't something I was able to, to take on at the time. So um, I, I do think there, there are some projects that, that could benefit both the town and a couple of students as a capstone for maybe a master's level course. So. I know some colleges and universities are requiring internships at the undergraduate level. So I think there probably is a market out there um, for seniors, you know, students who, who have the kind of experience that you're looking for. I think it's a great idea. Yeah, I think, um, you know, when I was in Worcester, I had an intern that helped process the benefits when I was the veteran services mm -hmm. director there. Um, and she was, she was a paid intern though. So it wasn't so much project based, but I did take on a project based um, for somebody who was, uh, um, it was a healthcare major. I forget exactly what it was, maybe health data science, something to that effect. And I wanted to see what my veteran and family population looked like for their health insurance, but I just didn't have the time to take it on. So I, I had him do an evaluation to see if people were properly insured, you know? Um, I'm not sure why, but sometimes some of those seniors, they would only be on Medicare and they would have very um, high amounts of, of medical bills. And so my guess was that I had a large population of people that I had to get enrolled into a Medicare supplement plan. Mm -hmm. uh, it turned out I was wrong. Actually, most people, uh, most people were properly insured, but um, you know, he got a very valuable project-based experience out of that. So, um, so, so that's that's sort of the trade-off. If I if I don't have a project, an intern uh, type arrangement doesn't benefit anybody. Would it would it be feasible uh, or desirable for you to reach out to the university and uh, Amherst College, Mount Holyoke College, Smith College to let them know? Um, that those intern possibilities exist in your office and encourage uh, teachers to, uh, to take advantage of that for projects within classes? Yeah, so I, 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 you know, just as I guess my test case, I did that with the uh, compensation study. Uh, the only college I heard back from, believe it or not, was UMass, nobody else was interested and I reached out to every business and economic program in the area so yeah it it probably is seasonal because students come through who are interested in various things classes right. do different things but yeah yeah but it, it is something I'm interested in you know when when, when something comes up it, it is a direction I would like to move toward that's yeah, not a very reliable source no, no. But it, like I said, it, it can be good for some of those projects, you know, like yeah. that for the health data science major to go through and look at everybody's insurance and what they're enrolled in. And, 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 and as a city, so I, you might not be familiar with what a veteran services officer does, but uh, there's two parts to it. Um, there's sort of like an unemployment benefit, and then there's a safety net. So if you're disabled um, or maybe elderly and on a fixed income, um, you can see your veteran services officer, and some people will receive regular monthly payments or others will get reimbursed for things like medical expenses and a few other things. So he was able to kind of go through, do whatever his major taught him to do, and um, help us find those areas to help people save money. So, Does, does the size of Hadley, um, the population of Hadley, uh, keep us, keep you from certain doing certain things that you would like to do i know we're under some sort of yeah me me specifically i don't think so you know like if i don't get an, an hr database i'll be okay you know we hire in onesies and twosies um you know I, I, it's a little weird doing employee orientation with just one person um uh, but we do it <laughs> you know and I, I i tell folks i'm like hey please don't think i'm just talking to you you know i I'm used to doing this with a group and we have some back and forth and some dynamics. So, you know, you tell me what you think you need out of orientation and we'll meet somewhere in the middle. So I'll check the block on this end and you tell me where your gap is and we'll, we'll combine the efforts, you know? So for some that might be benefits, others, maybe they don't understand when they can use vacation, you know, it depends on their, their work experience and where they're coming from. So, 
Um, you know, and it works. You know, you just got to find a way that works. So, uh, but I can tell you there, there are grants out there outside of, you know, HR that the town does miss on either, you know, due to population size or, um, you know, median area income, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's tough. You know, every community has somebody in poverty. Then how do you how do you get passed over, say, for a grant that's trying to, um, you know, bring some food equity to 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 where you are? And um, you know, it, it, it does, it's hard to say, but we don't always have the the right stats to support what we're asking for. So, but that doesn't mean we should stop asking. So. Do, do we know how many students, rentals, uh, students are living in Hadley as opposed to others? I don't, I might be able to squeak you out in a rough number, maybe if I were to dig enough through like the, some of the census data, um, but I, I'm really not sure. Uh, that that might be something you need to know, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's we've been curious. It came it, up at one. Yeah, point. it's it's not a number that I I I would look for, um, but you know, certainly for 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 your purposes, right? If you want to make sure people are getting, you know, treated fairly, whether they're applying for you know rental housing or mortgages or whatever the case may be, you have a a perfectly great purpose for that. Um, you know, I can do some asking around. I make no promises, though. I'll see if I can find something. Likewise, are there is there data on uh, uh, race, age, that kind of thing of our population in Hadley? Oh, that's easy. I could definitely pull that for you out of the Census Bureau data. That uh, that would probably take me about five ten minutes max. Wow. Yeah. But I that's the population that's... as a whole, not necessarily employee population, employee population no, but would be pretty cumbersome. I think that's something we mentioned that we would like to have as a committee at some point. Uh, I'm not yeah, sure. I'll, I'll make a note for it. Oh, I'm on the wrong page. Um, and then, um, yeah, that's pretty easy. I can get you that census data pretty quickly. I wonder if this, how complete is our town census? Uh, especially with regard to student renters who, I mean, how does the town know where they are to send them and who they are to send them a, a census form? You know, that's a good question and certainly outside my area of expertise. Yeah, okay, right. I wish I could answer for you. I just don't know. Yeah. And I have another question. You had said that, um, you know, you, you sort of looked at, and I might, might have this wrong, but you said, you know, you looked at similar towns like uh, Amherst, Deerfield, Hamden, South Hadley, I guess Hatfield. Sure. Um, how do, uh, you know, how do we compare as a town to uh, um, these other towns regarding budget, regarding staffing, um, that sort of thing? Uh, you know, that's, I don't want to say it's a loaded question, but it's hard to answer. Um, I would have to look at each town. So I got these metrics from the Mass Municipal Association. Uh, they're kind of our professional association that we belong to as a town. They lobby for, for a number of different economic uh, policy measures and you know, with the le legislature. And then they have several subset professional organizations. When bargaining union contracts, these are some of the metrics that they say may be helpful in developing, um, you know, salaries and benefits and a few other things. So I've only just begun by, you know, one, by choosing my towns. And then I have to look at their job descriptions almost individually um, to see that they're, you know, pretty consistent with, with what what we're doing. So, for example, Southampton, they don't have an HR director, uh, but they do have a town administrator. And, and prior to me, the town administrator was responsible for personnel. Um, and a lot of these, a lot of towns, you know, our size, they want to move in that direction because the labor law just kind of gets so much more complex. It's, it's kind of hard to keep up with. Um, you know, performance management is very complex. So, uh, you know, if you're kind of doing the bare minimum, if you're just saying, yeah, you know, right, there's a difference between saying don't be racist and being anti-racist. It's kind of the same thing with labor law. You know, it's 
you hire a new manager, you say, don't be sexist, but it's another thing to actively promote a positive, engaging work environment, you know? So one, you check the block, right? You know, I guess you did the right thing, you know? And the other thing, you're consistently keeping a pulse. So, um, you know, HR, you know, 50 years ago isn't what HR was today. You know, you kind of just filled out your employee card, signed up for health insurance, and you went to work. Um, you know, now it, it, it's a very broad discipline with some, um, you know, several specialties. You know? So, um, yeah. So I, I, I presume that, I mean, you, what, what, what you just sort of ended with there, that there are so many other specialties within HR that you feel like at least you have access to resources, because I don't know how one person could know all, all those things. I mean, there's benefit specialists, there's uh, uh, the uh, hiring practices, uh, you know, all these subspecialties. Yeah, so the professional association definitely helps. You know, I have a set of peers that I can go to and say, hey, this is a new one. You know, what do, what do I do? Um, and then there's also a database uh, kept of, you know, different laws, best practices, model policies. So when I, like, for example, when we're looking at um, ensuring we have a fair policy for, say, nursing mothers, I'm going to go right to the Mass Commission Against Discrimination and see if they have a model policy, you know? Because um, there's several aspects to that law that, you know, um, even if you're a nursing mom is hard to memorize and that's probably like gonna, right in that moment that impacts you the most. And then when you compound that with, uh, you know, maybe affirmative action and a few others, um, I always keep a cheat sheet handy, you know? <laughs> it's, it, there's a lot to it. So I'm cognizant of our time, Ed, um, but you know, you, you had mentioned a, a few things that you thought maybe we might be able to, as a committee, um, you know, help jar <laughs> with. And I think one of the things you said was, you know, if we knew any grant writers and, um, you know, maybe outside trainers, um, I guess, is that, is that sort of how you, yeah, you know, if, uh, and I don't want anybody to work for free, but if you know any outside trainers, um, I would love to kind of get a feel for their product and, and, and what they, they want to present. It's always good to have tools in your pocket. And then, you know, grant writers, you know, you, you never know, like there, there's so many different things out there that, you know, maybe I'm not paying somebody to do something but there's another way. So maybe there's a town resident who's a senior that would like to do a tax work off program. You know, they're recently retired or semi working. That would be a great opportunity. To, like if there's a retired grant writer in town, hey, you could help with this say technology grant. And then maybe there's an opportunity to receive a discount on your property taxes. So, um, you know, they, those are limited. I don't know how the assessor and collector determine how many of those spots exist, but, you know, it's just those outside the box opportunities, um, you know, and, and other ways to fund them. So. Um, I, I guess I, I have maybe one more question and that is, you know, you, you mentioned earlier on that you would like to have a bigger budget, especially in regard to training. And so I, I actually don't know what your budget is for training, um, but, um, you know, uh, you know, do you ever run into these situations where, you know, you would like to attend something or you would like uh, uh, a staff member to go and, um, and it's just not available to you because of lack of funding? Yeah, right now my, my training or tuition uh, budget is, is around $1,500. Um, it, COVID has kind of staved off people signing up for, for some items. Um, and of course, I was gone uh, quite a bit. I was deployed unexpectedly. So I can't fully answer your question. Um, but my gut tells me, I'm not sure 1500 bucks is, is fully enough. Um, if it were up to me, I'd have like a revolving training fund, you know, say of, I'm just making up a number, say $10,000. You know, if we spend five, great, we put the other five in. If we don't spend the 10 that year, that's okay. Like that would be my perfect world. And, you know, the, I'd have to look back at some of the statutes. It, I might not even be able to have a, a revolving training fund. It might have to be a dedicated funding source every year. I'm not sure. So. 
Does anyone else have any questions uh, they would like to ask? No, it's been very informative. Yeah, well, I hope, um, you know, I, I was, I, I'm not going to lie, I was a little nervous because I was going to go before the police chief and the two hot button items around, you know, diversity and inclusion, are obviously human resources, and then some of what we're seeing, you know, on, on social justice platforms and, and departmental funding. And, um, you know, no matter where you stand, it's a complex issue that a lot of people have some emotions toward. And, you know, I, I feel like we're doing the right thing, but it's one of those, um, you know, we're, we're a small town, we have limited resources, and it's hard to choose, you know, what, what you're going to take on and, and what you're going to say no to. And, um, you know, you, you folks seem like you're very supportive and, and you have the best interests of the town, and I really appreciate that. So. Well, it's been wonderful to have you come and talk to us about um, some of the issues that, you know, your department, you face, uh, what the town might face and, you know, what your vision is. Um, we really appreciate uh, you taking this time to speak with us. And, you know, we, you know, uh, we would like to think that, you know, you can come to us at any point in time <laughs> too and, and say, you know, hey, uh, we could use help with this and, you know, maybe there's something that we might be able to help with too. But um, on, on that note, uh, I, I guess we'll, um, we'll, we'll draw the meeting to an end. And um, thank you again, Ed, for, for, for the work that you do and for the time you've given us tonight. Oh, of course, you know, HR is not the most exciting thing always, but uh, I'm happy to help. <laughs>